better stand. Understanding Medicine Professor Azizur Rahman from Medistan Understanding Medicine. This is part two of our series of lectures on inflammatory bowel disease. In the first part, I gave you the introduction about inflammatory bowel disease and its differential diagnosis and broad classification. And this is the this video is about one of the types called ulcerative colitis. Now, although the name says ulcerative, that means there are ulcers and colitis mean inflammation of colon. It of course is colitis, but mostly or in many cases, there may be just inflammation, not actual ulcers. But that disease is still called colitis or ulcerative colitis. By definition, ulcerative colitis is a type of inflammatory bowel disease that causes inflammation and ulcers in the rectum and colon. This part is important because unlike Crohn's disease, which can affect any part of the gut, ulcerative colitis precisely affects our large intestine and inflammation usually starts from the rectum and it can affect any portion of the colon started from the rectum upward. The etiology and pathogenesis, uh, the exact etiology is not known, exact pathogenesis is also not known, but the theory, the part which we normally believe I'm going to share with you. So first of all, there is a genetic predisposition. Everybody is not equally prone to develop ulcerative colitis. The people, those who have family history, they are more prone to develop ulcerative colitis. So there is genetic predisposition, but then there is some super added environmental factor, which is presumably some infection. In an individual case, it is not possible to pinpoint which particular infection caused or precipitated ulcerative colitis, but it is usually some viral or some bacterial or some parasitic infection which leads to some uh, abnormal immune response because of the genetic predisposition. And there may be some factors uh, related to diet also. Diets certainly are responsible for aggravation of the symptom in some cases. But diet could also trigger the, the pathogenesis of ulcerative colitis. But mostly, this is theoretical. We do not know which diet or diets are actually responsible for ulcerative colitis. It may be different in different individuals. So because of genetic predisposition and some infection or some diet, there is dysregulated immune response. So mostly it is theory. In, in a normal person, if there is some infection, there is a very, very organized immune response against that infection and that usually helps to clear that infection. And that uh, immune response is specifically targeted against uh, that particular pathogen. But in patient with genetic predisposition to inflammatory bowel disease, this infection sometimes lead to dysregulated immune response and this dysregulated immune response causes inflammation in the gut. First, there is simple inflammation and if that thing persists, it could lead to ulceration. Now, in ulcerative colitis, this inflammation is confined to mucosa and submucosa. You know, there are four layers of intestine, mucosa, submucosa, muscular layer and serosa. Uh, Crohn's disease can affect all four layers, but ulcerative colitis mostly affects mucosa and submucosa. And Crohn's disease can affect other layers also. In fact, Crohn's disease can affect uh, structures outside the intestine also. So we do not know what mechanism will lead to ulcerative colitis and what mechanism would lead to Crohn's disease. But we know that there is many common features. Both have genetic predisposition. Both have the similar 
relapsing remitting uh, course and both response to immunosuppressant drugs so after the diagnosis we give medication and medication can also alter the natural course of pathogens if somebody does not take any medication it's more likely the disease will progress to the next stage but with early diagnosis and medication maybe we can affect the pathogenesis of this disease and further complication ulceration structure formation polyps formation may be uh, minimized or excluded so depending upon medication there could be uh, acute flares most patient they present with acute flares there may be some symptoms uh, patient is tolerating or coping with but then there is acute flare and that is usually the presenting symptom and then after we treat acute flare then we continue the treatment to prevent further relapses that is the treatment uh, plan so prevalence ulcerative colitis is definitely more common than a crohn's disease in any society but crohn's disease is also becoming commoner now uh, it may be catching up with the prevalence of ulcerative colitis but in our country certainly ulcerative colitis is commoner than crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is more prevalent in developed countries and affect individuals of all ages with peak incidence in the second or fourth decade second to fourth decade of life so uh, but it is somehow more common in western world it may be because of their different diet or maybe because of different uh, environment weather or maybe different genes so we don't know but the fact remains that ulcerative colitis in pakistan is less common than europe and also uh, in pakistan the disease tends to be milder it is more likely to be simple colitis than ulcerative colitis it is more likely to be affected only the distal part rather than being pan colitis and it is more likely to be just colitis without any extra perimeter extra intestinal uh, symptoms so gross pathology and if we see the colon this continuous inflammation now this is important because in crohn's disease or crohn's colitis there may be skip lesion in ulcerative colitis starting from the rectum it is continuous disease now it could affect just this part this could be called proctitis simple proctitis or ulcerative proctitis this may be called procto sigmoiditis because sigmoid is also affected this is distal colitis this is extensive colitis and this is pan colitis typically ulcerative colitis does not affect small intestine but just very few small portion of the ileum uh, can be affected and sometime when we do colonoscopy we can look into the ileum also and just few inches of the distal uh, ileum may also be inflamed so this is uh, the gross pathology of ulcerative colitis when you look at the mucosa you will see you will see hyperemia and sometime ulcer sometime very deep ulcers and sometime what they were called polyps and that is actually the intervening mucosa which is hypertrophied uh, histologically this disease is characterized by a diffuse inflammation and this is simple acute inflammation that means there will be infiltration with the neutrophils and other acute inflammatory cells and no granulomas there may be crypt abscesses you know there are crypts in the intestine there may be collection of pus cells there so called crypt abscesses and there may be ulceration involving mucosa and submucosa these ulcers are not very deep unlike crohn's disease in crohn's disease ulcers may be very deep but in ulcerative colitis mostly these ulcers are superficial uh, the natural history of ulcerative colitis varies 
in some cases there may be just one acute attack and that never recurs or in other patient it may be a progressive disease somebody develops acute flare and then never goes into remission but in majority uh, they have intermittent flares and remissions and others have continuous chronic progressive disease so i think it is a, a variable pattern but typically imagine chronic low grade symptomatology related to gut with acute flares of course you have to rule out many other condition before you can make a final diagnosis diagnosis is based on these four things but most important is biopsy but biopsy alone is not diagnostic so first of all symptoms and in the next slide i'll show you what are the symptoms the typical symptoms of ulcerative colitis then we go for endoscopic findings uh, when somebody does the colonoscopy there is inflammation and i'll explain what those findings are then biopsy uh, very important biopsy is used to uh, diagnose ulcerative colitis and also to rule out crohn's disease and many other condition and then exclusion for of other condition so i think diagnosis is not simple straight forward at one point of time you may not be sure if you're dealing with ulcerative colitis you may only suspect so but only after a thorough workup you will be sure that this is ulcerative colitis this is in fact a diagnosis of exclusion of all other diseases and then biopsy which is consistent with the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis now this is the diagnostic algorithm if somebody has chronic git symptoms like abdominal pain diarrhea sometime bloody diarrhea weight loss abdominal pain tenderness then we suspect uh, ulcer, uh, inflammatory bowel disease of course we have to first rule out some common infections infections are still fairly common in our country like amebiasis giardiasis tuberculosis some other infections so they all have to be ruled out and then we do simple labs like cbc a crp crp is a very significant indicator of chronic inflammatory bowel disease chronic inflammation actually and the importance of crp in this setting is that the commonest differential diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease is ibs irritable bowel syndrome which is a a, a functional disorder of the gut so if crp is significantly elevated and that would definitely support the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease against uh, irritable bowel syndrome and albumin level may be low so i think these need to be done stool study stool complete examination to rule out amebiasis giardiasis and stool calprotectin is very important now, but it has got some limitation what is calprotectin it is actually a protein which is uh, produced by the neutrophils so presence of calprotectin in the stool would indicate the infiltration of the gut with uh, with neutrophils that implies inf inflammation but of course that will be present in acute bacterial colitis also so only i think if you have ruled out other condition and there is a tie between inflammatory bowel disease and ibs presence of calprotectin in stool would indicate inflammation so inflammatory bowel disease i think that that is precisely the role of calprotectin so after that if calprotectin is elevated then certainly these patients should have a colonoscopy and then colonoscopy with the biopsy so after colonoscopy i think after endoscopic examination we are usually sure if this is ulcerative colitis because that has typical inflammation starting from the uh, rectum ascending upward so if that is the case the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis will be made and then of course we'll take biopsy and that will confirm the diagnosis if it does not turn out to be ulcerative colitis then other condition should be discussed i'm going to skip this part because this lecture is about ulcerative colitis 
symptoms of ulcerative colitis not, none uh, is very very uh, diagnostic but these symptoms when occur together then they they are fairly diagnostic uh, diarrhea often associated with blood now it has to be a bloody diarrhea there is another situation where somebody may have diarrhea and there may be bleeding from hemorrhoids so that is actually not to be counted as bloody diarrhea so if there is blood which is mixed with stool and stool is also semi solid or maybe watery and there is some mucus present and there is some blood that is highly suggestive of ulcerative colitis that can also occur in uh, in dysentery but after we rule out those conditions only then we consider the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis abdominal pain which may be in the form of colics cramps in the whole abdomen or on the lower part of the abdomen or it may be persistent pain depending upon the pathology and there is tenesmus tenesmus is a symptom there is it's a kind of rectal discomfort which means that after uh, defecation a normal person would feel relieved a normal person have this sense of completion after defecation but if somebody feels that there is still some stool in the rectum and there is some still discomfort after passing stool that is called tenesmus that indicates inflammation of the distal colon that is not a confirmatory uh, symptom of ulcerative colitis but it indicates inflammation in the terminal part of the uh, colon then there may be weight loss because of chronic inflammation bloody diarrhea and these people they also avoid eating because eating may precipitate symptoms so because of poor food intake and diarrhea they may lose weight and then fever and fatigue of course it's an inflammation and cause fever one of the causes of pgo pyrexia of unknown origin is ulcerative colitis then fatigue of course because of the inflammation because of associated anemia because of associated hypoalbuminemia there may be feeling of fatigue also so these are non specific symptoms but if you have ruled out acute infections and if you have ruled out uh, irritable bowel syndrome then these should suggest a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease and further workup in the form of endoscopy should be done the signs are abdominal tenderness may be diffuse tenderness of the abdomen may be there may be fever documented on uh, temperature and there may be anemia again pallor because th this is one of the features of uh, inflammatory bowel disease other signs of malnutrition like wasting or there may be dehydration so all these signs again none is uh, specific but these would indicate uh, uh, the presence of uh, inflammatory bowel disease now in some cases not all in fact in a small percentage of people with ulcerative colitis there may be some systemic manifestation in my own experience the systemic manifestations are very rare in our country as i said earlier ulcerative colitis in pakistan tends to be mild in every respect so systemic manifestations are not common but those which are reported they may be aphthous ulcer more common in uh, crohn's disease then there may be spondyloarthritis there may be involvement of the spine bamboo spine formation and uh, syndesmosis formation or there may be uveitis there may be inflammation of the uvea and sclera and then there may be visual problem if there is uveitis erythema nodosum these tender nodules on the chin these are erythema nodosum and then uh, erith uh, there is pyoderma gangrenosum this is pyoderma gangrenosum i think this one is also pyoderma gangrenosum so these are the features and then primary sclerosing cholangitis this would indicate uh this will be manifest in the form of slight abnormality in liver function test alt alkaline phosphatase may be elevated so these are some of the systemic manifestation 
so we do not know what is the mechanism behind these systemic manifestation of ulcerative colitis but we do know that once the disease it goes into remission with medication then these extra intestinal manifestation they also uh, go into remission uh, some traditionally we used to do some radiological examinations and ultrasonography may have be helpful no definite sign but it may be useful to rule out other possibilities barium enema used to be done as a routine not very commonly these days because the diagnosis is mostly made by um, endoscopic examination then ct colonography that means it's a kind of ct where you uh, somehow visualize colon uh, if somebody cannot undergo biopsy cannot undergo endoscopic biopsy then maybe these may be helpful or when you suspect some complication uh, like stricture formation abscess formation or malignant transformation then these tests may be useful some of the findings there will be loss of hostile markings and i'll show you in another x-ray in another slide what is i meant by hostel hostel uh, marking and uh, when they are lost how do the colon look like mucosal thickening and lead pipe type of uh, colon the lead pipe of course is without any uh, hostration and i'll show you this, these in the next slide now this is the normal colon it's a barium any ma barium has been uh, injected to the rectum and this is the descending colon tracheal colon ascending colon so these are the hostra these are these uh, uh, portions are called hostra and when you are when the host when this is loss of uh, hostra this is called lead pipe lead pipe type see, see it is like as if this is characterless lead pipe thing so this is actually seen in chronic uh, ulcerative colitis then diagnosis basically comes from endoscopic uh, picture and endoscopic biopsy continuous area of inflammation starting from the rectum going upward there may be erythema loss of vascular pattern there is normally a very specific pattern of vessel those who do endoscopy they know we can see uh, pink mucosa and we can see the vessels so if there is edema of the mucosa these vessels may disappear so when there is erythema these vessels may become more prominent in some areas so there is loss of normal vascular pattern and the presence of pseudo polyps in some cases pseudo polyps mean that in the part of the uh, colon where the there is no inflammation that actually gets hypertrophied now it stands out as if there is the tumor actually polyp actually it is this hypertrophied mucosa like this one i'll show you the closer up to show the inflammation in more detail now this is the close up you can see that and uh, this is bleeding actually the intestine becomes so friable that when we touch it with the endoscopy endoscope then there may be bleeding and you can see the loss of vascular pattern this is all hyperemic erythematous and bleeding and this is very typical of ulcerative colitis on biopsy we see diffuse inflammation non specific infl inflammation that means infiltration with neutrophils and crypt abscesses and ulcerations now these are some of the images you can see this is uh, these are the crypts and you can see this inflammation all this is infiltration with neutrophils and you can see the surface is also ulcerated this this is ulcerated and there may be crypt abscesses these are crypt abscesses uh, differential diagnosis intestinal infection i have already mentioned grdss amebiasis tuberculosis and some other infections in some specific group of people like people with hiv people with immunodeficiency state there would be some unusual infections also 
there are certain infections which are seen in certain geographic areas. So accordingly, you would consider some infection. Celiac disease is worldwide and can mimic inflammatory bowel disease. Symptoms are very similar, but you can diagnose on the basis of certain tests like IgA, TTG, uh, and stool examination and uh, upper G endoscopy is required for celiac disease diagnosis. Irritable bowel syndrome is definitely the commonest differential diagnosis. If somebody has chronic GI upset with no significant bloody diarrhea, then I think it is more likely that the person has in, uh, irritable bowel syndrome because that is much more commoner than inflammatory bowel disease. So that is to be ruled out, but you don't want to miss inflammatory bowel disease because inflammatory bowel disease, if missed, can lead to serious complication. Whereas irritable bowel syndrome is just little uh, inconvenience, maybe, uh, uh, but uh, of course you don't want to miss inflammatory bowel disease. Crohn disease, one of the types of inflammatory bowel disease that also comes in the differential diagnosis. Crohn disease will be more difficult to rule out if it affects large intestine, Crohn's colitis. But in Crohn's disease on biopsy, uh, the inflammation is granulomatous and also it could have skip lesion and in the next video I will explain the features of Crohn's disease in more detail. Now treatment, first of all, treatment of acute flare, that is when patient usually presents with severe bloody diarrhea, dehydration, fever, abdominal pain, tenderness, that has to be managed. Then once patient is out of acute flare, then we develop a strategy to prevent further relapses. So patient has to be on some kind of medication to prevent further relapses. Then these patients need to be continuously monitored and they have to be uh, there have to be a surveillance program to, to, to rule out any malignancy because that is one of the complications. So treatment of acute flare, let me just go into some more detail. First of all, the treatment of choice is corticosteroids. It is an inflammatory bowel disease and most potent anti-inflammatory drug we ever know is corticosteroids. So corticosteroids can be given intravenously, can be given orally, and can be given rectally. Uh, intravenous is the most effective, and I think in the acute setting, I would certainly like to give the most effective medication. So I will start with the intravenous one, and hydrocortisone, 250 milligram, three times a day, or some other equivalent corticosteroid, like dexamethasone or methylprednisolone. So these can be used, but uh, hydrocortisone perhaps would be the most effective and once patient uh, in the initial phase there is another reason to give intravenously because patient is not usually taking oral food so we start with intravenous once patient recovers a bit then we switch over to oral oral steroids are also effective and then gradually we come to the rectal now rectal steroids in the form of enema they are safest way of giving steroids because they are they act locally uh, but they are not very effective as compared to IV so depending upon the severity you would choose a route there's a very interesting medicine which is not available these days but that is a, a corticosteroid tablet uh, which we take in the form of tablet but it is not absorbed in the intestine, in the small intestine. It goes to the large gut directly and is released there. So in the large gut, it is, it is not absorbed. It has got a topical steroid action. So I think that is very interesting medicine, but unfortunately not widely available. So that is a, a, a one way of giving oral steroids, but having only topical action in the large gut, not having systemic side effects. Then symptomatic treatment, patient's fever, patient's pain, patient's dehydration, that has to be treated. And then one important thing is that lopramide, which is an anti-diarrheal drug, because patient's main symptom may be diarrhea, and anti-diarrheal drug should be avoided if possible, because they have this 
कोली एंटी कोलिनर्जिक अफेक्ट एंड दे मे लीड टू डायलिटेशन ऑफ लार्ज गट एंड मे एक्चुअली कॉज पैरालिटिक आइलियस इट माइट गिव पेशेंट सम रिलीफ बट इट माइट प्रेसिपिटेट ए सीरियस कॉम्प्लिकेशन सो दे शुड बी अवॉइडेड आई थिंक दोज एंटी डायरियल विच दिस अब्जॉर्ब एक्स्ट्रा फ्लूड दे शुड बी गिवन then if patient has got serious condition then hospitalization should be uh, recommended for uh, intravenous steroids for iv fluid therapy and possible surgery this condition called toxic megacolon and that might require surgery and in next slide i'll show you what a toxic megacolon is so after patient is out of this acute flare then we give treatment to prevent chronic relapses and one such drug is sulfasalazine now sulfasalazine has got two components one is amino salicylate and the other one is sulfa drug so sulfa is actually given to uh, to sulfa is attached with amino salicylic acid so that amino salicylic acid goes direct to the large gut amino salicylic acid is like aspirin so if we take it orally it will be absorbed in the small intestine but we want it to go to the large gut and we want it to be released in the large gut so to to do that it is bound with a sulfa drug but in the large gut sulfa and five amino salicylic acid they detach from each other Uh, salicylic acid they have anti inflammatory action and sulfa is absorbed and this sulfa may cause some systemic side effects especially if somebody is allergic to sulfa drug this drug would be contraindicated now scientists have developed another fine uh, another type of drug which is mezalamine this is again 5 amino salicylic acid but not bound with sulfa there is another mechanism and this is currently considered to be drug of choice because it does not have sulfa so mezalamine in pakistan we have it available with the name of mesacol uh, i think internationally it is called asacol or pentasa so 4 to 800 mg 3 times a day preferably 1 hour before meal if we give any drug with meal it is more likely to stay in the stomach and in the small intestine and less is going to be available in the large intestine where we actually need this drug so i always recommend that mezalamine or sulfasalazine should be given 1 hour before meal time so that it reaches the large gut without getting disturbed or without getting held in the small intestine or the stomach then immunomodulators like azithromycin uh, sorry uh, as a thiopurine uh, as a thiopurine or any other many many immunosuppressant drugs may be useful but commonest is as a thiopurine we give mezalamine if response is not adequate we add as a thiopurine of course this is a immunomodulator so we have to be then extra vigilant for any possible side effects a new development in this field is this anti tnf infliximab you know uh, this tnf tumor necrosis factor is a inflammatory mediator which is involved in the pathogenesis of ulcerative colitis and more so actually in crohn disease and infliximab is a monoclonal antibody and that can be given and that would uh, slow down the disease it has got more a beneficial effect in crohn disease than in ulcerative colitis but it is used in ulcerative colitis also not available in our country so far and there is some nutritional support avoidance of trigger foods uh, if patient has a specific observation about any diet which has which triggers the symptom that should be avoided usually dairy products are responsible uh, for this and they should be avoided then in some cases when patient cannot take anything orally there is pan colitis and then we give parenteral nutrition for some time now role of surgery of course surgery is the last resort treatment but in ulcerative colitis colectomy can be curative that may not be true in 
Crohn's disease because in Crohn's disease there may be other lesion but in in ulcerative colitis because there is continuous involve, uh, involvement of the large gut so if we remove the affected part patient is cured but of course one would have significant morbidity and chronic symptomatology due to colectomy itself so that is why it is a treatment of last resort appropriate counseling and treatment should be offered psychological support because these patients often have associated depression because of the chronic disease now complications of ulcerative colitis one is toxic megacolon what is it it is actually in some cases there may be more extensive inflammation deeper inflammation it may affect the muscular layer and the serosa also so because of that the gut wall becomes very weak and it becomes dilated now we call it toxic megacolon because typically on x-ray uh, abdomen or on uh, barium enema barium enema should be avoided in those patients who where you suspect toxic megacolon but if you have done it then that would be visible on, on these two imaging techniques the colon is dilated why it is dilated because the colonic wall has become very weak because of transmural inflammation colon cancer is another uh, complication rupture of colon is possible uh, this endoscopic procedure can also lead to rupture and then malnutrition dehydration anemia they are all uh, complication besides the systemic manifestation Uh, monitoring and surveillance regular monitoring and surveillance is needed uh, including colonoscopies uh, if somebody has a long history of uh, ulcerative colitis like for example 10 years i think then uh, frequent maybe once a year colonoscopy is indicated to to rule out any malignancy or other complication now this has brought me to the end of this presentation now let me give you the summary chronic inflammation ulcerative colitis is a chronic inflammation of colon that affects the distal part the rectum and the sigmoid and the rest of the colon aim of the treatment is to achieve and maintain remission we do not have a definitive curative treatment so far except colectomy which is the treatment of last resort colonic biopsy is essential for the diagnosis uh, Although biopsy in itself may not be diagnostic, but overall scenario when we rule out other condition, then biopsy is fairly uh, diagnostic. There is significant morbidity and mortality despite regular treatment, and surveillance is needed to detect colon cancer so that the treat appropriate treatment may be offered. Surgery, if needed, may be curative. So. That is the end of my presentation. I hope this video was uh, useful and uh, please leave your comments down below and I am looking forward to see you in the next video which will be on Crohn's disease. Professor Aziz Rahman from Medistan Understanding Medicine.